Okay, welcome everyone. I have three o'clock, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, you are joining us today for our Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up Series webinar talks. Um, today we are, have uh, Gardening with Native Plants for Pollinators. So welcome. Uh, my name is Erica Sontag and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Master Gardener Program Coordinator in Jackson County. Um, and I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. Jackson County is located within the traditional homelands of the Tacalma people. Tacalma means those along the river. The Tacalma um, lived along the Rogue River uh, here in the Rogue River Valley, and they were forcibly removed to the central Oregon coast and the Willamette Valley between 1852 and 1856. Today, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Round Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians identify their members as living descendants of the Tacalma. So thank you for coming today to this Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up Series session. This series is produced by the Oregon State University Extension Master Gardener Program and has been organized and led by a group of Master Gardener coordinators, OSU faculty and staff from across the state. The OSU Extension Master Gardener Program educates Oregonians about the art and science of growing and caring for plants. We are in 27 counties across the state and train thousands of Master Gardener volunteers. OSU Extension Master Gardeners are volunteer educators, neighbors, and on-the-ground researchers who serve their community with solid training in science-based sustainable gardening and with a love of lifelong learning. So if you're a Master Gardener, thank you for dedicating your time and knowledge. If you're not a Master Gardener but are interested in becoming one, we'll be hosting a training for new volunteers in 2022. You can learn more about the program and about other workshops in this series on our website. Today's workshop is being recorded and captioned and will be accessible to view along with all of the presentations in this series, including the presentation slide decks um, on our website. There will be a link for the chat. And so just some general housekeeping, um, due to the high amount of participants today, the chat box has been turned off for participants, but our Q&A box is open, so we strongly encourage you to add questions to the Q&A and the panelists will work to answer your questions uh, throughout the presentation. And we will also have a chance um, for some question and answer with the presenters at the end of the talk. And if you are looking through the questions and you like a question, you can use the upvote feature and that will move the question to the top of the list. So the panelists will see that that's something that folks are really interested in and will prioritize asking that question. Um, again, closed captioning is available and should be happening live right now. Um, and there is a function to be able to see that or hide that if you wish at the bottom of your screen. So now I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, today we have Gail Langolato starting us off with Jen Hayes coming in a little bit later to talk to us all about gardening with native plants for pollinators. Gail Langolato is a professor of horticulture and the statewide coordinator of Oregon's Extension Master Gardener Program. Together with her lab group, the Garden Ecology Lab, she studies the plants, insects, animals, people, decisions, and management practices that either improve or degrade a garden's ability to promote environmental and human health. Jen Hayes is a graduate student pursuing a PhD degree in horticulture and entomology at Oregon State University. Jen is a Vermonter who is passionate about pollinators. She fell in love with native bees as an undergraduate in the Ricketts lab at the University of Vermont. Since her first exposure to bee research, she has had the opportunity to work on pollinator studies in Vermont, Ecuador, North Dakota, and Oregon. Together, Gail and Jen are presenting from Corvallis, Oregon, which is located in the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. So now I will hand it over to Gail. Thank you, Erica, and thank you to the entire team that helps to make this series possible. Um, it is my great pleasure to talk to you today about gardening with native plants for pollinators. Um, as Erica said, my name is Gail Angelato and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And it is also my pleasure to co-present with Jen Hayes. 
We have our contact information here just in case there's something that you hear during this presentation and you'd like to follow up with us individually. I'm going to be presenting on research that was done by another graduate student, Erin Anderson, focused largely on native plants and pollinators. Jen's going to be talking about her research related to native cultivars, native plants, and pollinators. We'll also have this contact information up at the end of the talk in case you don't capture it here. Our talk today is going to be divided into four parts. First, I want to take a little bit of time to define what we're talking about when we're talking about native plants. Uh, particularly in the retail garden market, I found that sometimes there can be a little bit of misunderstanding about what a native plant is and how to identify it on retail market shelves. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time setting the stage. Secondly, I want to present a theoretical point of view as to why native status matters, particularly when we're talking about specialist herbivorous insects and whether or not the strong association between herbivorous insects and native plants necessarily translates over to pollinators. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about you gardeners and why native plants may or may not be um, widely available in retail market retail garden markets. And if you'd like to see more native plants on retail garden market shelves, what it is that you can do. And then Jen is going to be taking us home talking about her really innovative research looking at native cultivars, native plants, and pollinators. And even though we have a talk planned for you that's going to take about 45 minutes, I figured that some of you just want me to get to the punchline. So I'm going to start off with, here are the 10 native plants that I think you should plant based upon our research if you want to support bees. What you see on the screen right now is a graphic which has our 10 recommendations for native plants which have high bee attractiveness based upon three years of continuous research conducted in Canby, Oregon, so on the west side of Oregon. Over each individual floral species are two sets of circles. The outer circle represents the relative abundance of bees on that plant, and the inner circle represents the relative diversity of bees on that plant. So you can see that the plants that we're recommending, whether it's Verily Facilia, Globe Gilia, Doug Aster, that in general, they have high bee abundance, and or high bee diversity represented by the inner circle. There are some plants within our recommendation that may not be the heaviest hitters for um, one or the other. Yarrow, for example, was not like a heavy hitting plant for bee abundance, but when it came to bee biodiversity, yarrow was one of our strongest performers. And I'm going to show this slide um, in a couple other places throughout this talk. So if you do you want to get down our list of 10 recommended plants? You'll have an opportunity to see this later. I also want to mention that this is a screen cap of a publication that we're preparing to publish through OSU Extension. So we hope to have it out in wide circulation shortly. And then our sub section slides for all of the four parts of our talk, I'm using my personal four favorites of the native plants that we found to be really highly supportive of pollinators and in particular native bees in our area. Uh, these are my four favorite plants because they all had high bee biodiversity and abundance as well as I think that they're beautiful. I just love them. And I'm hoping that by assaulting your eyes with these beautiful photos of native plants in flower that you might consider giving them a chance in your own garden as well. So first I'm going to launch right in talking about what is a native plant. Well, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is sometimes abbreviated as NRCS, defines a plant that is native to the US as one that was found in the United States before European settlement. And by corollary, a non-native plant was a plant introduced with human help to a region or habitat where it was not previously found um, upon, European, upon or after European settlement. There's also a category of naturalized plants 
which are non-native plants that have at some point escaped cultivation and they no longer need human intervention to maintain themselves in an area where they are not native. So these naturalized plants, um, they're established, they're part of our local ecosystems now, and because of that, they're often lumped together with native plants, but they are not truly native to, um, to a region. I want to talk a little bit about what a cultivar is. Um, I have to tell you that my own personal background and training is in entomology, so the fact that I'm a horticulture professor uh, gives me secret giggles on occasion. Uh, some of these plant codes, cultivated plant code, botanical plant code, took me some time before I was able to decipher what they meant. So a cultivar is a plant that's selected for certain characters that are maintained during propagation. So plant breeders can select plants for bigger bloom or brighter colors or um, shorter stature. And the continued existence of these cultivars from one generation to the next requires some type of human intercession. Basically what this means is that these plants do not produce true to seed. You can't collect the seeds of a cultivar, plant them up and expect to get the same plant type that you collected that seed from. If you want to identify a cultivar in the nursery, um, then what you'll see is the Latin name that we're used to seeing, uh, genus and species. And then after the genus and species, you'll have a notation for cultivar. And this notation in cultivar is enclosed in single quotes. So for example, here we have red flower and current, current on the left-hand side of this slide. Its um, Latin name is Ribes sanguinium. And here on the right side, we have a, um, a, a cultivar of red flower and currant, Ribes sanguinium, single quote, Oregon snowflake. So the fact that you see the single quote and usually these very colorful names inside the single quote, that's what you should look for to know whether or not you're looking at a cultivar versus just a straight wild type of a plant. So if you're looking for native plants in the nursery, you want to look for those that have just the Latin name. If they have the Latin name followed by a, a colorful name in single quotation marks, that lets you know that it's a cultivar. Not all plants that are listed by just the Latin name are going to be native, um, but if you start to know what the native plants are to your region, you can start to look for these straight wild type names, and you'll know that when you see a name in single quotations that that may be a native cultivar. I also wanted to go over how to identify hybrids in the retail garden market. Um, a hybrid is a cross between two different species. So for example, Lavangela times intermedia is a cross between English lavender and Portuguese lavender. And the fact that we see this X in the name of um, Lavangela intermedia is a good sign that, is, that it is a hybrid. You can also have hybrids that are also cultivars. So for example, Lavangela intermedia comes in several cultivated varieties, including Grasso and Provence. So look for the single quotes, that tells you if it's a cultivar, look for the X, that tells you if it is a hybrid. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you're talking about a native plant that you also have to say where a plant is native to. Native status is always defined relative to a region. So in some of the native plants that we've studied, they're broadly native to North America, or they might be more limited to the Western US. Some might be even more specific just to the Willamette Valley. So when you're talking about native plants, making sure you're saying where that native plant is native to is an important component to remember and consider. So for example, goldenrod is one of the plants that we studied for three years, looking at the pollinator community on goldenrod. Um, it is broadly native across North America. So this is a widespread native plant, broadly native to most parts of North America. We also studied Doug Aster, one of my personal favorite plants for pollinators as well as for its beauty. Um, Doug Aster is more narrowly native to the Pacific Northwest. 
And if we look at botanical atlases, such as the Oregon Flora Atlas, and see where the distribution of Doug Aster in the wild is within Oregon, we see that it's actually fairly narrowly endemic to the Willamette Valley region of Oregon. So just to summarize, um, a native plant is a plant that was found in the United States before European settlement. When we're talking about native status, it really is important to say where that plant is native to, um, to provide some context for the region for which you're talking about when you're talking about native plant status. If you're looking for plants on the retail garden market that are reflective of the area to which it is native, so that you have not only a plant which is native to that region, but you have um, genes in that plant which are native to that region, you want to look for suppliers that advertise source identified native plants. They let you know where they collected the seed or where they collected the propagules of that native plant from. How close to a region do you have to be in order to be considered native? There are many suggestions, but in general, those folks who do restoration work suggest between 60 and 200 miles from the point of origin of a native plant is a good benchmark to ensure that you have native genes represented in your population. However, having that mile benchmark isn't always possible. So sometimes people suggest using an ecoregion, which is the same as the native plant that you're trying to establish in your yard as a surrogate. Just another shot of my four favorites. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you might start to care for them a little bit as well if you don't already. So next I wanna talk about why native plants matter. Um, native plants matter in particular for insect herbivores because the physiology of many herbivores are such that they can only feed on a narrow uh, taxonomic range of plants with which they have a long evolutionary history. And this is particularly the case for herbivores, and there are a lot of insects that are herbivores. So most folks estimate that about 50% of all insects are herbivores and about 70% of all those insect herbivores are specialists that are only capable of feeding on plants within one taxonomic family or in some cases one taxonomic genus. Uh, perhaps one of the best known example is the monarch butterfly caterpillar, which is only capable of feeding on plants in the genus Asclepius, uh, so milkweed plants. We also see this in our own gardens with cabbage white butterflies, which are only capable of successfully feeding on brassicaceous plants, uh, plants within the cabbage and collard family. And the strong relationship between insect herbivores and specific host plants was um, very well captured and articulated in Doug Tallamy's wonderful book, Bringing Nature Home, where he makes a very strong argument for including native plants as part of our garden landscape in order to support wildlife in our area. Um, Doug Tallamy, like myself, is also an entomologist. We actually came out of the same laboratory group. We both had the same dissertation advisor, but separated by a couple of decades. Um, one of the projects he worked on for years was scouring the entomological literature and trying to find every host plant that every possible caterpillar ever was known to feed on. And he captured this and found that there was a really strong tie between um, lepidopter and caterpillars and native host plants, such that when he looked at the number of species of caterpillars on exotic or introduced plants compared to their native counterparts, he found that native plants supported substantially more caterpillars than did non-native plants. If we're looking at woody ornamentals, uh, we see a 14 times increase when we go from non-native to native plants. If we're looking across all ornamental plants, we see a three times increase as we go from um, non-native to native plants. 
And then one of the things that I thought was really fabulous about Talamy's work is that him and uh, Karim Burkhart, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, they went out and they looked at the number of caterpillars that they could find in yards in Pennsylvania that were predominantly planted with native plants versus exotic plants. Um, as expected, based upon Talamy's previous work, they found significantly more caterpillars in yards which were landscaped with more native plants than those which were landscaped more traditionally with more exotic plants. And the really cool thing about this research, which I don't have a slide to show here, is that they show that that increased caterpillar abundance and yards landscaped with more native plants actually translated to having more bird species and a greater abundance of birds in suburban yards. So we know that because the vegetation of plants is very well protected against insect herbivores, that plants are very well defended against insect herbivores, and that those defenses have kind of narrowed the feeding range of many insect herbivores so that they can only feed on plants within a single family or a single genus. We know that that's the case for herbivores. Plants don't want their vegetative tissue eaten. Because if that vegetative tissue is eaten, then plant fitness is diminished. But what about pollinators? If I'm taking a very anthropomorphic view of pollinators, um, we can say that plants want pollinators to come visit them because as those pollinators come to visit the plants, to sip the nectar, to collect some pollen, they actually help the plant to reproduce. They actually help to successfully pollinate the plants. So in general, there was a sense that even though herbivores and plants might have very specialist relationships, there was not as much understanding about whether or not plants would have a strong specialist relationship with, um, with their pollinators. Before I came to Oregon State, uh, I worked in New York City at Fordham University in the Bronx. And we did some studies where we installed these butterfly conservation areas into community gardens across the Bronx and East Harlem. And we looked to see after three years, did we see any difference between gardens planted with these butterfly conservation areas and those that weren't planted with them in terms of pollinator abundance in these gardens? And we didn't see any difference, um, no difference in total bee abundance, bumblebee abundance, non-native honeybee abundance on native versus introduced flowers in New York City gardens. So in addition to looking at the total community within a garden, we also looked to see where the bees were visiting. We also noted that the vast majority of butterfly observations um, nectaring were on native plants and that leafcutter bees were predominantly visiting non-native flowers to native flowers. But a couple of caveats about this study. First of all, it was conducted in a hyper-urban area. Our gardens were in the South Bronx and in East Harlem. Second of all, a lot of the insects that we saw in these studies were non-native themselves, such as honeybees, and most of the leafcutter bees were non-native, Megachile rotundata, the rotund leafcutter bee. So perhaps it's no surprise that there wasn't a strong association between pollinators and native plants in these gardens. So when I came to Oregon State and my first PhD student at Oregon State, Aaron Anderson, who you can see here on the right-hand side in the foreground, when he said he wanted to look at native plants and pollinators, I was kind of like, you know, I don't know that there's going to be a real strong association between native, plant and native plants and pollinators, but if that's your passion, go for it. I want you to study what you love, and Aaron truly does love native plants. So he set out to study the associations between insects and 27 species of native plants, uh, he set up a three-year field study at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center in Aurora, Oregon, um, near Canby. He had replicate plots, which you see outlined here in red, um, that were one meter squared in area. And between each plot, there was six meters of turf grass so that we had some degree of independence between individual plots. 
since he had five replicate plots of 27 species plus five blocks uh, plus five plots of a turf control that meant that he was monitoring 140 small research plots across three and a half acres for three years it was a massive undertaking just want to give a shout out to lucas costner in the background who was an undergraduate who did a lot of fantastic work to support aaron's research Aaron monitored bee abundance and diversity across those three years as a plot was approaching peak bloom and conditions were good for pollinators, which basically meant that the sun was out and it wasn't too windy. Aaron and Lucas would sit for five minutes and they would count the number of insects that came to visit each floral um, uh, flowers within each study plot. After they finished their pollinator counts, Aaron also took this modified leaf blower, uh, which was modified to be an insect vacuum and sucked up all the insects off of the plot. Didn't suck them all up. He did four plops uh, to subsample the insects on each plot. And then he took those samples back to the laboratory to identify any additional bees that might have been captured by the bee vacuum, as well as any other insects. Just a side note that Aaron's working on his data for insect diversity right now. Um, he identified over 40,000 insects from this three-year study. And so very soon we're going to be able to tell you which plants were great for parasitoids and predators as well. Just to give you an overview of what some of the bee abundance data looks like, this is a summary plot from his 2019 field season. Mean bee abundance for five minutes counts are on the y-axis. The names of the different species that flowered that year are on the x-axis. In addition to studying 23 native species of plant, Aaron also had four non-native comparison plants. These are marked with the red asterisks and include oregano, lavender, catmint, and sage. Whoops. Um, so when you look at this plot, it should be very apparent to you that the most abundant bee plants were oregano and lavender. But when I tell you that the different colors on the bars stand for different types of bees, and that this yellow orange right here stands for the number of honeybees within a plot, it should become quickly apparent that even though oregano and lavender were heavy hitters for bee abundance, most of the bees on those plants were non-native honeybees. If we wanna look at the strongest attractors of wild bees, we see that Phacelia, California poppy, goldenrod, Doug Astor kind of rise to the top of our list of star pollinator plants. So even though bees were abundant on oregano, lavender, and catmint, um, I just want to note that a lot of these were non-native honeybees. When I talk to gardeners about what plants are really, really highly attractive to, highly supportive of bees in their garden, a lot of gardeners will say like, oh my gosh, my lavender is covered with bees all the time, or oh my gosh, my oregano is just hopping with bees. But I really want you to encourage you to take a closer look and see whether or not, are they covered with lots of different bees or are most of them are non-native honeybee? And if you do have plants which are covered with non-native honeybees, is that so bad? Well, that's actually an area of really active and um, lively scientific debate right now. Uh, honeybees are known to deplete nectar and pollen from plants very efficiently, which some folks suggest can have negative effects on native bees by reducing native bee reproduction. If resources are depleted from plants by honeybees, this means that native bee females may have to use more energy to find other resources. If they have to use more resources and they don't have enough energy to put into the eggs they're laying, that may lead to a skewed sex ratio um, towards more males and against uh, females. If they have fewer resources to provision to their offspring, that can lead to smaller offspring, which have less of a chance of surviving. And the more often a female has to fly from the nest to collect nectar and pollen, 
that actually increases vulnerability of her brood to parasites and predators. So I just want to show this slide one more time, which are my, um, well, not my, it is research-based recommendations on the top 10 native plants for bees. Remember, once again, um, the outer ring equates to abundance. The inner ring equates to uh, diversity of bees on those plants. If I were to put lavender up on this slide, lavender would have an abundance ring, which is equivalent to dugaster. Lavender attracts a lot of bees. But when we look at species richness of bees on lavender compared to other plants, we get a very different story. Uh, so this is a graphic that was developed by Leanne Locker. She developed the previous one as well to try to translate Erin's research for the general public. Each little dot represents one bee species. It was found on that plant across three years. So on lavender, across three years of study, uh, we found eight species of bee. We found 16 species on Phacelia, 28 species on Gilea, 74 species of bee on Doug Aster. I really love the way Leanne made this graphic where each little circle represents one bee species. Um, you can see that Doug Aster has so many bee species associated with it that you can't even see the photo of the plant itself. So um, part three, I just want to say a little bit about native plants and gardeners and things that maybe you can look for that you can do to encourage wider availability of native plants in retail plant nurseries. If you go and look in most retail plant nurseries, you're going to find a fairly limited selection of native plants. Luckily, it's starting to change, but by and large, um, your native plant section is going to be focused on, um, you'll have some native ferns, you'll have some native yarrow, and selection beyond that is pretty limited. Because there's a relatively limited audience for native plant purchases, um, nurseries don't put a lot of um, time and effort into producing nursery stock for native plant nursery for native plant stock for nursery sales. There's also a problem that when you put most native plants on a retail nursery shelf next to like this big boisterous, like beautiful um, cultivated non-native plant, most native plants just can't compete. They're not going to be the prettiest plant at the ball. And oftentimes consumers are going to overlook them when they're shopping for new plants. But this limited availability of native plants in nurseries generally means that consumers don't even have a chance to learn about them. They generally lack a preference for native plants. And so it's kind of like this vicious feedback circle where demand and availability are both suppressing opportunities for native plant sales and purchases. Um, I saw this on my Facebook feed the other day. Uh, the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture put out that meme that you see on the right. And then the quote that you see on the left, the beauty of a plant is not just the plant itself, but all of the other organisms it can bring into your garden. I saw that and I was like, oh my God, I love that quote. And then I realized like, oh my God, that's my quote. They must've taken it from somewhere. We're trying to coin this idea that the beauty of a plant really is more than skin deep, that we need to look deeper and look at the ecological beauty of a plant. And that includes all of the wonderful organisms that it can help to bring to your garden. We did some um, consumer testing survey to see what folks thought about the different plants that Erin was studying. I have Verily Facelia up here um, because poor Facelia ranked as dead last in terms of consumer preferences for um, different plant purchases. But then when we tell people, like, look at all of the beautiful bees that we find on Facelia, that Facelia was associated with having 16 unique bee species and five bee species, which were significantly and strongly associated with Facelia, it can help change people's minds about this particular plant. 
So sometimes I say that Visalia needs its own PR campaign. This is my little effort to give it a little bit of PR. If you plant Visalia, it may not be the prettiest bell at the ball, but look at all of the beautiful new friends you can bring to your garden if you take a chance on this humble plant. Want to do the same for two other plants which ranked very low on um, consumer preference for plants. In general, gardeners just thought that these plants looked too weedy, were not beautiful enough, um, just didn't seem to be worth the effort. Pearly Everlasting, a great drought tolerant plant, 21 different bee species and significantly associated with two early flying spring bee species in the genus Andrina. Goldenrod, which many people think of as not a favored plant because they wrongly suspect it as being the source of allergies. It is not. Um, plants which are pollinated by insects have pollen, which is too large to be carried efficiently by the wind. Um, goldenrod had 14 different bee species and was significantly associated with this beautiful little Melisodes bees which um, databases show us is not widely spread across the US. It is a rare bee. So by planting goldenrod, not only do you have this beautiful profusion of golden bloom well into the fall, but you're also going to perhaps support a special and rare friend in the form of Melisodes microstictus. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it off to Jen. Alrighty, so I am just going to note in advance, I'm definitely going to go over my allotted time limit, but I'm also going to speak as fast as I possibly can to make sure I can cover all of the information I was hoping to. Um, so yeah, my name is Jen. I am a grad student with Gail. And in this last section of our talk, I am going to briefly discuss some plant traits to consider when gardening for pollinators, and then do a more thorough overview of what we know about native cultivars and our current research on natives and cultivars. So many plant guides recommend selecting plants based on color. It's generally accepted that bees prefer uh, flowers that are white, blue, or yellow, or ultraviolet and butterflies prefer reds, magentas, purples, and other bright colors, although we've probably seen all of those rules broken before. Um, so color can be helpful in guiding selections, but other treats might be more important when planting for pollinators. So first, of course, this whole talk is about native status, so I won't dive too deeply into that. But in general, when creating pollinator habitat, perhaps the most important consideration is selecting plants that bloom across the season. So from early spring to late fall. Um, doing a little research to determine the nutrition that your selected plants provide to pollinators is also important. So for bees, we wanna make sure that they have access to both nectar and pollen throughout the season. So if you use this planting scheme along the bottom, you might find out that California poppy doesn't actually produce nectar, it only produces pollen. Um, so if that's the only plant that's flowering in your garden for a specific period, you might want to pair it with something that does produce a lot of nectar to complement it. And then if you're interested in attracting butterflies, you want to make sure that you include both nectar and host plants in your garden. So a quick Google can tell you if your butterflies of interest are generalist egg layers or if they have specific or preferred larval hosts um, like monarchs with milkweed or American lady butterflies and pearly everlasting. Um, so what we're gonna focus on for the next few slides is native ours, which is a term that just combines the words native and cultivar. You can use the terms um, interchangeably and I probably will for the rest of this talk, just so you know. Um, and I wanted to provide a visual example of what native ours can look like. So, and again, you'll probably see a lot more examples for the rest of this presentation. So here we have Clarkia amoena, which has the common names Godacea and Farewell to Spring. And on the far left is our native, and the three to the right are native cultivars. So you can see that they have their little 
little cult of our name and little quotation marks. Um, and they're very pretty. <laughs> and um, these are a couple, two of these we have in our study. We are using the scarlet and the Strauss white, um, but not the maiden blush plank pink. So why do native ours exist in the first place? Of all the plants sold in the U.S. hort markets, only 13.4% are reported to be native, but they may not actually be true natives as many of the genotypes available in the markets may have been bred or selected for ornamental qualities. And many native plants don't respond well to nursery production, so they can perform really poorly in retail containers and then fail to meet customer, customer ex customers' expectations. Um, like you don't want to go to a store and buy the fried little brown plant. You want something that looks nice and healthy. So native ours are one solution to this because they can often be easier to propagate in large numbers and they can be more attractive in containers and landscapes than some true natives. Um, so natural variation in plant color and morphology exists in wild species. So one example is this Clarkia. Sometimes you'll see it without these little red spots in the middle. There was a study done that showed that the presence or absence of spots doesn't change who visits the plants. Um, and then I'm sure many of you have seen that something as simple as a change in soil pH can actually change colors of hydrangea from white to blue to purple. Um, so native ours may allow nurseries to capitalize on um, positive traits or traits that gardeners may find attractive, such as isolating rare color morphs that can be found in the wild. I don't know if any of you have ever seen like the bleached white camas that sometimes shows up in fields of camas and um, bee balm also can be white in the wild. And then there are all these other ornamental characteristics that natives may be bred for as well, which we've separated into display, which is all about like the, the visual features of the plant, so color and size. And then the actual rewards are probably not something that are intentionally changed, but can be altered potentially in plant breeding. Um, because a lot of ornamental characteristics are actually achieved through mutations, interspecific breeding, or changing and multiplying genes, or even selecting, selecting for function loss in specific genes. So these may occasionally have cascading effects that we're not necessarily immediately aware of. Um, and then I just wanted to give a couple examples of um, how plant breeding can impact pollinators um, with some studies that have already been done. So uh, although color can be really simple on the genetic scale, dramatic changes in color can impact plant pollinator interactions. So it, all it takes is one single gene change to shift this petunia from being white to fuchsia. And the primary visitor of the white a uh, petunia is a hummingbird moth, but when the color of the plant is changed, it gets almost no visitation by this hummingbird moth and instead becomes visited primarily by this bumblebee species. So just one gene change and the primary pollinator of the plant is completely altered. Um, and I also want to discuss a study that has been pretty central to the foundation of our own native and native art research. Annie White studied Vermont native plants and native ours as part of her PhD project at the University of Vermont. She had 19 different native and native art pairs and tracked pollinator preference between those pairs. So I am going to walk you through her findings when we look at only um, native bee visitors to her plants. And I'm going to use these little symbols on the left hand side of the different colored bees. So I'm also going to first block out these three plants which didn't have published results. And then we're going to move on to 
groups where there was a preference for the native. So six of her plant pairs showed that pollinators significantly preferred the native plant over the native R. And then we move to no preference. There were five plants where they were about even in terms of how many bees they were able to attract. And then she only had one plant in her study where the cult or one of the cultivars came out ahead of one of the native plants. So there are other studies that are looking at natives and native ours that are actively in progress. Um, and there are some like this one which have yielded really mixed results, which just kind of highlights the need for further evaluations. So we are in the second year of our own study looking at pollinator preference for Willamette Valley natives and native cultivars. We have two main research questions. So the first being, are native plant species more attractive to pollinators than native cultivars? And then our second question is, if there is a difference in attractiveness, can we figure out what traits might be responsible for that? So we have three hypotheses that kind of respond to our second question. So we expect three possible outcomes. Um, the first outcome would be a positive response. So where the native R maybe has been bred for a trait that actually makes it more attractive to pollinators than the native. So we think things like increased bloom duration or density or bloom size could have this positive response. We also expect that there might not be a response so that pollinators may not see a difference between the two uh, between the native and the cultivar and that might happen just because they look really similar or they're not um, very different at all. So maybe it's just been bred for resistance traits and that's it. So that's not something that would necessarily show up on the pollinator level. And then we also think we may have plants that show a negative response. So this uh, example here is baby blue eyes, which the native is this lovely little blue color. And then one of our cultivars, penny black, has black flowers. So that's not something that you typically see in garden. So we think that changes like that could alter pollinator um, perception of native plants. So, um, our experimental garden is located at Oak Creek Center for Urban Hort, which is on OSU's campus. And these are our study plants. Um, they are a subset of the plants that were used in Aaron's study. And we selected them based on them existing on a spectrum of pollinator attraction so that we can look and see if plants that were not super attractive to pollinators in Aaron's study if their native ours maybe have a trait that make them more attractive or the opposite as well. Um, so across the first row, we have yarrow, Western red columbine, camas, and Douglas after, aster, and those are our perennials. And then we have the annuals on the bottom, including farewell to spring, California poppy, and baby blue eyes. And across these plants, you can see pretty easily the ones that have color differences. The ones that are a little harder to see is some of our plants have different colored foliage, um, specifically the Calistoga from the yarrow and the white Camas cultivar. And then we also have some plants where the flower size is bigger. Some of them have, um, just way more blooms. Uh, the Douglas Aster cultivars, for example, were taller than I was this year versus the native grows about to knee height. Um, so we do have a variety of different traits exhibited in our plant groupings. So I'm very briefly going to go through methods here. Um, while our plants are in bloom, we measure three main variables to try to quantify the differences between the native and, natives and cultivars. The first is the actual insect visitation, which we do through physical observations and then also collecting individual specimens that we can identify to species in the lab. We are also looking at floral display to see if that changes across our plant groups. So we're actually measuring the flowers in terms of their size and diameter. 
We're looking at total bloom count, bloom duration, and we're also using a specialized type of photography to see if we can mimic bee vision and see if there are differences in our flowers that actually might only be visible to a bee's eye. And then we're also going to look at floral rewards and in particular um, pollen nutrition and sugar content of the nectar that our plants produce. Okay, so I want to share some preliminary findings with you from our first two field seasons, and I want to really emphasize that these are preliminary findings, um, and they're based solely off of our observation data. We don't quite have our specimen data ready yet, and they've been calculated just from the average number of native bees that visited our plants during our observations over the last two years. Um, and one thing that I also want to highlight is we do expect these findings to be different from year to year. One thing that Gail always says uh, for perennials is the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and then the third year they leap. So because we see, you know, um, perennials slowly maturing, we really wouldn't expect year one to be the exact same as year three. So we are going to have at least three years of data collection to try to average the trends over that time. And so that can explain some of the differences we might see in the data, as well as natural variation in pollinator populations from year to year. So we're going to start with 2020. And using our little color-coded bees again, we had three plants last year where the native seemed to be more attractive than the cultivars. We had two plants where um, the findings were kind of inconclusive, so they may have all received about the same amount of visitation. And then we have two plants where the cultivars were more attractive. And so, Again, we would expect the annuals to be pretty consistent from year to year, but we can see there were some changes in the perennials and one of the annuals, but the nemophila just does not do well in full sun. So we might end up having to exclude it from our study altogether just due to lack of data. So I would just take that with a grain of salt. But this year you can see that the yarrow um, the native yarrow was actually ahead of the cultivars in terms of visitation. And then um, everything else is pretty much the same except for the nemophila. And I wanted to add again, so this is looking specifically at native bees. I ran uh, this data set again and added back in all pollinators. So when we look at native bees specifically, that means we've excluded um, honeybees, any non-native bees, which we don't really see a lot of at our site, and then butterflies and flies. So if we were to add all of those pollinators back in, the only thing that changes is in the Douglas Aster group, the Savi snow, so the white cultivar actually um, shows a higher preference than the native in this case. And now I will quickly try to wrap up here. Um, it can be a little difficult to interpret these findings and understand how they apply, how to apply them to your own gardening decisions. So I wanted to end with a little bit of guidance. And first and foremost, I really think you should consider what your gardening goals are if you're questioning whether or not to include natives or native cultivars. So if you wanna create like a beautiful pollinator habitat to conserve really sensitive species, then maybe nativars don't have a place in your garden. But if you garden primarily for aesthetics, then maybe the idea of Oregon natives coming in a variety of shapes and colors is super exciting to you. Um, you should also consider what plants you have access to. Like we've talked about, native plants can be really difficult to find, and maybe you don't have a native plant nursery in your area. Not everyone um, has the time or resources to go out of their way to buy plants either. 
Um, so it's possible you might only have access to native cultivars and they're not without value, even though there were many cases in our studies where the native was found to be more attractive. That doesn't mean that the cultivars didn't receive any visitation. They can still be a great pollen or nectar source, or they can even fill a gap in your garden where nothing may be blooming. Right now, I would say the biggest concern of gardening with native cultivars is the potential for them to hybridize or interbreed with their wild counterparts and then be potentially become the dominant genotype in the wild. So this could be problematic for the conservation of sensitive pollinators or ecosystems where hybrids cannot support specialist insects, um, such as the hybridization of Kincaid's lupin. Um, in the case of the Fender's blue butterfly. So personally, I believe that cultivars may have their time and place in gardens, but we do need to find efficient and effective ways to make sure they don't cross with wild populations and also to evaluate them for their value to wildlife. So that's it for me. Um, this is just our acknowledgements, acknowledgement slide. Um, we want to thank Sherry Shang and Spike Wadsworth, as well as the ODA and the Garden Club of America for supporting our research. Um, this page also lists all of the nurseries that I got seeds or starts from for my specific plants. And then we also have credits for people who have provided photos for our presentation. And now we can move on uh, to the Q&A. Just let me know, should I stop sharing or should I just leave this slide up? Well, Jen, I saw that one of the questions and I apologize, I um, am not, I touched the wrong thing on the Q&A. They were asking about UV and um, if we know anything about what cultivation does to UV. Do you happen to have a hidden slide of Savea's research in there that you could show? Um, not in here, but I can pull one up pretty quickly here if you want to answer a different question while I look for it. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Um, so there was another question. Um, Ellen was asking, do honeybees compete with native bees? And with the popularity of beekeeping and climate change, will this become an issue? Yeah, and there's a lot of evidence that suggests that honeybees are efficient and effective pred predators, competitors with native bees for limited resources. Um, and that's because honeybees and their social system of organization, they're just so good at finding plants and collecting the pollen and sucking up the nectar. And other folks have shown that that can have a negative impact on native bees. There have been other studies that have shown um, that when you put honeybees in a system with bumblebees, that those two compete for limiting resources and actually will chase each other off of floral heads. And that overall that can actually have a positive benefit for plant reproduction because it encourages more visits to different flowers, which increases outcrossing um, and effective fertilization. But I think just because most bees are solitary bees where it's just one lonely mama going out and visiting flowers and collecting pollen and nectar, she's just going to be no match for what is the equivalent of Star Trek, the next generation Borg of honeybees going out and taking what they need to keep their hive going. And what does it mean for um, beekeeping in urban areas? If you have a neighbor who is a beekeeper, perhaps you see their honeybees coming and visiting your flowers. And um, in some areas, it's actually a point of real contention where folks um, are not as welcoming of having honeybees into their garden because they are concerned about limited resources. There are fights going on in national parks about whether or not beekeepers should be able to place their hives there over the summer, what that means for native bee communities. So yes, it's an active area of um, contentious debate. Thank you, that is fascinating. Um, great, looks like Jen, you found your slide. 
Um, and the question was from Stephanie, has anyone looked at um, both native and cultivar varieties from an ultraviolet perspective or any spectrum that pollinators may be able to see that we cannot? So the short answer is yes, we are, <laughs> which is pretty exciting. Um, as far as I know, no one else has specifically gone out and photographed natives versus cultivars under UV or like simulated B vision, but we have a wonderful undergraduate student who maybe you can have talk in the series at some point when she's a little farther along in her project. Um, and she is specifically working on taking ultraviolet photos of all of our study plants, as well as these B vision ones, um, which just combine the different spectra of light that only insects are able to access. So it's a very difficult thing to study because we don't have a baseline of what all of our natives look like under ultraviolet in the first place. So the first step is going through and seeing if we have any ultraviolet um, kind of fluorescence in the natives and then photographing the cultivars and seeing if it's the same or different. Um, the baby blue eyes is one of the first plants to flower in our study and it's also the most interesting under UV. And this one is a grouping where we see that um, the cultivation of the native ours actually has changed the ultraviolet um, fluorescence that pollinators see. So on this top row, you can see um, the native. And in these two photos, this darkened circle, and over here, it's kind of hard to see, but it appears as like a really bright cyan. That is um, what we call a bullseye nectar guide. So it's a, a contrast in the center of a flower that leads pollinators to those resources. And again, it's kind of hard to see. These are really early photos, but we see that same exact bullseye in the snow white cultivar. And then we get kind of a double in the penny black where it has like the cyan in the middle, as well as on the tips of the plant. So the snow white has the same ultraviolet um, visual cues as the native, but the penny black is different. Just very exciting. Great. Thank you. Um, so since we have reached four o'clock, I'll go ahead and give our closing statement. Um, but I think that Gail and Jen had offered to stand for a couple extra minutes to answer a couple questions. Um, so I would like to thank you all for coming today. And if you're a master gardener volunteer, you can receive continuing education credit for today's session. Just track and submit your time through the guidance of your local uh, master gardener county coordinator. Our next webinar in this series will be adapting your garden and landscape for climate change on October 12th with Weston Miller, also of OSU Extension. And the whole schedule for Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up series is on our website, and we hope to see you at a future session. And just a reminder, um, the recording of this will be available on that website within about two weeks, um, including the slide decks and closed captioning. So thank you so much. And then um, there was, so we have a lot of questions in here, so I don't know if we'll get to them all, but Gail, it looks like you had been going through some, so I don't know if you saw some others that you may want to answer, or I'm happy to pick and choose some for you. Sure. I'll answer the ones about irrigation and um, concern about climate change and concern about nectar flow. I think I can do a couple of those at one time. I'll just share one brief slide of what Aaron's study plot looks like at the end of the season. We selected in the list of plants that Aaron studied, we only selected drought tolerant and drought resistant plants because quite frankly, it cost me $2,000 to irrigate the field every year and I didn't have the money. So if you refer to the list of um, plants that Andrea put in the chat, um, know that all of them are pretty drought tolerant and drought resistant of the plants that we studied. As Jen mentioned, um, Nemophila, baby blue eyes, is probably the wimpiest among the bunch that we studied. Most of the others were super drought tolerant. Just to show you what goldenrod looked like at the end of the season, everything else is toast and goldenrod is still flowering. In terms of whether or not those plants which are um, 
uh, starved of water will continue to pump out nectar uh, during times of drought. That's, other, that's another thing that we're hoping to study in collaboration with colleagues from UC Davis and UC Riverside is putting these drought tolerant plants under different irrigation regimes and measuring nectar flow. At the moment, I don't think we have a, um, a solid answer about how drought affects nectar flow in drought tolerant plants. Great, thanks. And then there is a question related to um, wildfire and smoke conditions. Susie says that she saw a marsh decrease in honeybees at her property and especially in the lavender field. Oh, I just lost the question. There's this year. Bumblebees have been more prevalent, wondering if last fall's fire or smoke conditions might have influenced that. Sure, so when we said that we only studied uh, bee observations or bee visits on bee friendly days, we made sure that we could see our shadow because bees orient and navigate using polarized light and their ability to see sunlight. When there's smoke in the air, when it's cloud cover, bees can't forage. So if you have consistently cloudy and um, smoke filled skies, that can limit bee success because it's going to limit their ability to go out and actually look for food. So it's kind of like the mix of like a lot of little paper cuts, especially down there in Southern Oregon where you've had smoky skies for a very long time. Um, it may not kill the bee right then. Uh, it could have high level consequences for honeybees and bumblebees, uh, could reduce their fitness, make them have smaller offspring the next year. Great, and then um, Leanne, you actually marked the question that I wanted to ask next because there were a few folks asking about this. Um, and of course I just lost it, it bumped away. Um, but it was related to, is there any benefit in planting um, lavender and oregano um, to help provide food for non-native honeybees as a way to make room for native bees on other plants. And I'm sorry, I don't see the question exactly anymore. It disappeared, but I think that was the gist of it. Oh, here it is. Does it make sense to plant lavender and oregano to draw the honeybees away from natives for native bees? And a couple of people asked that. I think so. That's actually one of our hypotheses that you might be able to, as a gardener, use lavender or oregano as a trap plant for honeybees, leaving the native plants open for non-managed wild native bees. Okay, great. Um, we could be here all afternoon. So would you like to take maybe one more question and then we can, we can call it good? Um, can I power through like two or three real quick? Oh yeah, go ahead. It's up, it, I'll just leave it up to you. That's great. Okay, so which native plants are good for um, butterflies, really just native plants in general are good for butterflies because the caterpillars are specialist herbivores that rely upon um, native plants for their growth and feeding, which are resistant to deer. Most of the plants that we planted were resistant to deer with the exception of camas. The deer would nibble the tops of the camas, but the, um, the plants seem to recover. Um, at what point is a native R just like any other perennial except better adapted to the region? Um, I, I, I don't know that I can answer that one right now. I think that Jen's research is trying to disentangle. Is there any meaningful difference between native R's, um, native plants? And we always have lavender in there as our benchmark plant. Is it illegal to grow native cultivars if the native is listed as endangered? There are actually very few native cultivars available on the market. Jen probably had to spend two months before she could find suppliers for her native cultivars. Um, and in terms of how we're doing the analysis, uh, are we lumping the cultivar data together, making multiple comparisons? Jen is looking at her plant group, so the native and then each of the cultivars. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading more. If you want to find nurseries that sell native plants, your local native plant society is a good resource. Oregon Flora also has a good list um, of 
providers as well. And sorry, I was just trying to whip through as many as I could quickly. Yeah, that's, that is great. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. And Andrea posted in the chat, if we have not gotten to your question, please reach out to your local extension office um, to speak with your local expert. And again, Gail and Jenna have provided their contact information graciously so that you can reach out to them as well with more questions. Um, so we really appreciate your time, everyone today. Thank you so much for being here. And Gail and Jen, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. It was really, really great. So thank you all, see you later. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you.